um, binary and logic, right? So I would like to start in here. Here's a truth table. It's a simple exercise, easier than one in recitation. Uh, a, B, right? 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And here's the output. Uh, let's say that's, uh, I'm picking something random here. And I want to create, create a DNF formula. We remember the DNF recipe? What is it? Look for the ones and figure out every one what it means. This one is what? Not A and B, right? That's this one right here, not A and B. Or in between, what's this one? This one right here? A and not B. And the last one is A and B, right? So I could start manipulating those things. I could say uh, that's not A and B, right? Or, and now I'm going to open parentheses in here, all that. So that's A and not B, this, or A. That's kind of the first opening the bracket. And then, uh, or, sorry, and, that's an end. Uh, a and not B, that, or B. So what I did, I open up parentheses, I take this as a whole, and I did it this or A, this or B, I got here. And then this is not A and B, or uh, A or A, now I'm opening this stuff, A or A, and not B or A. And if I open this, so this is uh, this and that, and now I have A or B here, and not B or B. So I have not A and B, or A or A is? A and not B or A uh, and A or B and B or not B. That's true, right? I'll write it as one. So then I have not A and B or um, a, how much is A and not B or A? I say in here, this comes down to A. A has to be true for this to work. And when A is true, this one was too. And we can open parentheses, make it so we don't skip steps. A and B and not B. Uh, or A and A. A and A is A, right? And A or B. So that's not A and B. Or this here is A. A and A or B. That is A. So how much is this now? Not A or A and B or A. Not A or A? True. 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 So this whole thing is A or B, which we could have tell from the truth table. It's A or B. It gives one when one of them is true. What is the CNF formula? Recipe. Look for the zero. zero. So I only have one zero. And I'm saying I don't want to have that case that's saying I don't want to have not A and not B. Not A and not B is this right here. But I say I don't want to have it. 
So that's saying, how do I negate, how do I move these nots in parentheses? That's not, not A, or not, not B, which is, of course, A or B. So that's a little bit of logic. Um, here's a, quite a few things that the other sections went through. here then write something in here because I don't want to erase that um, <coughs> for any x integer a 2x plus 1 is odd no or false can you reread the second thing you said what can you reread the second thing you wrote please this yes 2x plus 1 <coughs> I sometimes make the ones. True or false? True. True. I could have said this this part here, there's a predicate that says odd of 2x plus 1. That means the same thing. It's saying that is an odd number, written as a predicate. Or you can write in you know, plain English, that is odd. In this class, that's fine. Um, how about for any x? Z is the set of integers, right? Uh, there is a Y, also integer. And uh, X plus Y is even. Is that true? For any X, I can find a number that when I add those two things, <coughs> that's even. True or false? True. 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 For example, for any x, I get to pick the y, right? I can pick y, 4 minus x. Is that an integer? If this is an integer, 4 minus x is an integer. And then the sum, I can say here, pick or choose. The sum x plus y will be? If I choose y to be 4 minus x, when I add x to it, what do I get? Four. Is four an even number? <coughs> How about the, if I reverse the quantifiers? For there exists a y integer, and for every x integer, x plus y is even. So it's the same statement. But what I did, I say exists goes first. In this case, y would have to be fixed. You can pick any y you want, but you have to choose it first. And once it's chosen, that's it. It's fixed. Is that true? No. no. Because for any y in z, no matter how you pick this y, if I choose as a counterexample, So whatever somebody picks the y here, if I choose the x to be 1 minus y, then the, the x plus y will be what? Somebody picks a y, any y, and I choose an x 1 minus y. That's a valid integer, and it's allowed because it's for any x. What would be the sum then? 1, which is not <coughs> How um, about the following statement? Can I move the board now? How about the following statement? For every x, y in z, x plus y is even if and only if x is even and y is even. <coughs> That's one piece. Or x is odd and y is odd. So what I'm saying is this, this, this is two implications here. It's that implies this, premise conclusion, but also backwards, premise conclusion. 
That's what if and only if means, right? If and only if. You can also write it as this and that. Means it goes both ways. Remember, one is the implication. The other one, the reverse, was called what? Hmm? The, the conclusion implies the premise is called what? No. So the implication A is B, that's implication. B implies A, it's called converse. And what is the contrapositive? Not B implies not A. That is the same as the implication, but not the converse. Remember last lecture. So this one, one is the implication, the other one is the converse. <coughs> now, if, I think this is true, right? To get an even sum, you either have to sum up two even numbers or two odd numbers. So you I can prove it that if it's even, I get this. And then I have to prove the other way that if I'm in one of those two situations, that's why it's an or in between, then I get an even number. So how do we make a proof of these statements? Question? Okay. So let's let's do it really quick because it's simple. I'm gonna put this sign every time I see an if and if when I make a proof, I'm gonna say which way the proof goes. So when I put this sign, I'm making that proof that way. When I put the other sign, I'm making this way. Sometimes I can make a proof directly in both sides, so then I don't put any sign or I put the equivalent sign. So this way, I'm saying x plus y is even. That's my premise now. You don't have to write premise. I'm going to say true. Whenever we, we, we prove something, we start assuming the premise is true. Because that's what's given to us. Right? And now, I have four cases. x, y. The cases are. Uh, even, I'm going to write even as two times something, because even numbers are two times something. And uh, y is also even. I'm going to say this is two times, say, um, uh, g. That's even, even case. And then I can have 2k plus 1. That's odd, right? The numbers that are odd are 2 something plus 1. And this is still even. And then the other case is 2k to g plus 1. That's an odd and even. And then this is 2k plus 1 to g plus 1. I have four cases. This all the possibilities that there are for two numbers. Even, 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 odd, odd, even, odd, odd. And I say if my premise is true, so I can say this is case 1, case 2, case 3, case 4. My premise is true. The first thing I'm going to say, I have to be in case, uh, I can compute here the sum, right? And I get 2k plus 2g. That is 2 times k plus g. Or I can get 2k plus g plus 1. Or I get, again, 2k plus g plus 1. I hope it's not too fast, so you guys can follow me. 2k uh, plus g plus 1. I just added up these quantities, and I used 2 as a common factor between them. So now I know what those are. This in here is even. This is odd for sure. This is odd, and this is even. So I'm looking at my cases, and I'm saying, <coughs> if this is even, then I must be in case of either 1 or case 4. Right? Because I see the sum is even. That's what the premise is telling me. That means I'm here or here. Premise excludes those two cases. <coughs> but now case 1 is what? Case 1 is x and y even, both of them. Or case 4 is x and y, both odds. 
And you can see how with this table I can do the other proof that's the other way. This way, right? This way I go case by case. I have two cases, so my premise here will be either x and y are even, both even, or x and y are both odd. Now if they're both even, that means case uh, one or case four. In case one, I get the sum to be even. <coughs> or case four again, I have the sum, which means sum is even. Now, in these proofs, in this class, formalism is secondary. I expect you guys to be able to follow a formal proof. That's not very formal, but I could make it more formal. That's not expected of you to make formal proofs. What's expected is to be clear the reasoning. You know, the, the reasoning has to be rigorous, has to be mathematic. But how you write it, like if you put or instead of the or sign, or if you say even instead of even the predicate, that's okay. As long as your thinking is rigorous and correct, we take it. So we put emphasis on thinking correctly, not in writing rigorously mathematics. So if you make mistakes in thinking or arguments, that's going to cost you. But you can write informal proofs. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, things like, um, how about this? Uh, object is a square. If and only if object is a rectangle, the object has equal sides. So that's an end between those statements. Is that true? A square is a rectangle with equal sides. How about a rectangle with equal sides? Is that a square? Right. By the way, what's called a four sides object with equal sides? What is that? Huh? Rhombus, right? So if I just say four equal sides, is that the same as saying an object has four equal sides? Any object with four equal sides is necessarily a square? No. This is true. This, this equivalence, this is false. Because objects with four equal sides can look like this. <coughs> Diamonds, you play that. Rhombus, if you play drums. <coughs> this piece has four equal sides, but it's not a square. <coughs> so this is false. But this is true. OK, um, so I think you, you guys go uh, get how this goes. The last thing I want to talk on, on, um, on binary here uh, and logic is um, to finish off that proof of that square game that we already did that recitation. So I, I will just do it very fast to make sure everybody's on the same page. I have a, a table here. Let me say one, three, four, for example. And uh, maybe I'll add another one. And uh, I write the count in binary, right? This is a one. This is a three. That's a one, zero, one. That's a five, sorry. One, one. The four is one, zero. Zero and the two is one zero. Put it on line. One, two, three. So here's how the player goes. Strategy. <coughs> Compute soar on across lines. Across rows. So if I do a sort here, what do I get? <coughs> Zero. 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 One. 
if the result, the, I'm going to call the result score across uh, binary rows. I'm saying binary rows because those are binary counts. If this is not 0, 0, 0, 0, like in this case, there is a winning strategy. So the player who moves now has a winning strategy. The strategy being reducing the sort to 0, 0, 0, 0. So the strategy is make sort of binary rows equal 0, 0, 0, 0. That's the strategy. So if it's already 0, 0, 0, 0, unfortunately, there's nothing I can do. The other player has a winning strategy if he plays correctly. Maybe he makes a mistake. But how can I bring this? I'm guaranteed to bring this in one move to 0, 0, 0, 0. How do I do that? So the move is what? Take the highest count. and replace, take some pieces, take from highest count, some pieces to get to soar binary rows equals zero, 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 zero. How do I do that? I look at the highest count, there's the highest count, right? And I say, let's ignore for a moment what's in here. What would I need to be here? to get the XOR of zero. So one and one, it's already zero, XOR. So what do I need here? <coughs> zero. One, zero. One, one, zero, one, it's already zero, right? So this one is in the way. So what I need, so that four count is the same as one, zero, zero, need to be, I need it to be what? What would I need here to get the source 0, 0 in this case? I need 0, 0, 0, right? Because if I put 0, 0, 0, the XOR is 0. So I need 0, 0, 0 because 0, 0, 0, if I put it here, would be 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and then 1, 0. The XOR will be 0. So I need it to be 0, but it's 4. How many pieces I have to take out? So the results take all of them out, take all pieces out. So there's always a way to bring this, replace the highest count with whatever count is needed to bring it to zero. The second part is, if I leave the table with the XOR on binary rows, zero, 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 zero my opponent, <coughs> Cannot do the same. <coughs> now suppose I leave the table with zero, 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 zero. So I leave this count. I leave one, 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 and one, zero. My opponent has to take a piece from somewhere. So suppose my opponent picks this row. <coughs> opponent picks this row. I'm going to prove this by a technical contradiction. I'm going to assume that the statement is incorrect, and I'm going to get to some absurdity. That's proof by contradiction, right? So here's how I'm going to prove this. And I'm going to say here contradiction, or by contradiction, to give the reader an idea very clearly from the beginning how this proof is going to go. How many people have seen proof by contradictions? About half, okay? So that's a very well known proof technique. It's proving the contrapositive instead of proving the implication. Say, let's assume yeah. the conclusion is false. We'll do some derivations, some mathematical manipulations, and we'll reach something impossible. Like the prem premise has to also be false. <laughs> so, how are we going to do this? Uh, we're going to do two things. First, we assume, let's assume opponent has a move to leave it 0, 0, 0, 0, right? That's contradicting directly the conclusion. The conclusion of this statement says my opponent, when it moves, cannot leave the board at 0, 0, 0, 0. 
The negation of that is assume there is a move for my opponent that will keep the table 0, 0, 0, 0, right? Is that the negation of the statement? So the statement says there is no such move. That says there is a move. So it's a negation. What we're going to do is going to sort the other rows. Meaning except the one uh, my opponent moves on. So in this case, which will be if opponent picks this row here, what will be the other rows that are being squared? Xord. This and this. So those will be a XOR of the rest of the table, which is one and one zero. The XOR of that if, if I do it by rows, is what? One one. Now let's take the original count, the one that I left. Let's call this value here A. Let's take the original count on that row. The original is how I left it, one one, right? One one, I'll call this B. And let's leave the opponent after move count on that row. We don't know what that's going to be. Let's just call that C. So opponent moves on this row, takes some pieces out. We don't know how many. But I leave it as 1-1. One, one. That is my count B. The XOR on the other rows is A. And opponent, after it moves, can take one piece or two or three pieces out. It's going to be left with a count. Who's with me so far? So if there is a move that leaves it 0, 0, 0, what that implies, the, the final XOR after my opponent moves is between what and what? After my opponent moves. Is the rest of the rows, the rest of the rows have to be untouched, right? My opponent can only move into one row. If he picks this row, the other ones have to be untouched. Every move can only happen in one row. So the overall XOR after move, after the move, it's XOR between what? All the other rows, which is A, and what my opponent leaves there on the table, which is C. That has to be, according to this hypothesis here, the contradiction of the, the, the contradiction of the conclusion, the, the negation of it, that has to be 0, 0, 0, 0, right? That's what it says. There is a move that leaves it at 0, 0, 0, XOR. But that XOR is between the rest of the rows and whatever my opponent leaves, this C. We don't know what the C is, but there is some count that does this. How about before the move? When I left the board, we had a sort between what and what? Not after my opponent moved. When I left the board this way, sort was between the other rows, which was still A. And when I left the board, how many pieces were on this row here? B. Which was also 0, 0, 0, 0, because that was what I left to the board, 0, 0, 0, 0. <coughs> so let's recap this thing. Who's A? A is the sore on the other rows, the rows that are not being touched by my opponent. Who's B? B is the count that I leave in, 1, 1. Who's C? The count that my opponent leaves in, because my opponent chooses this row. I, I just say, I don't choose the row, my opponent chooses, but whatever the row is, A is the XOR on the other rows, B is the count I live on that row, and C is the count my opponent lives on that row. If I leave it at 0, 0, 0, XOR between A and C, and my opponent has a move to still leave it at 0, 0, 0, that means that XOR between A and B is the same as XOR between A and C. Remember the theorem that we did the recitations? If that's true, implies what? B must be equal to C. 
This is an exercise from the recitation material. Why is that a contradiction? Why is B cannot be equal C? Because what? My opponent has to take at least one piece. He can't leave the same count. The count I left on that row is B. My opponent has to take at least a piece. He can't leave the same count. It's only this B that will make the sword being zero. If you take any other piece, the sword cannot remain the same. Which proves that what I assumed initially was a contradiction. Proves the theorem. How many people follow me? We did this at recitation, this, this exercise. If the XOR between AB is the same XOR between AC, the only way that can happen is B equals C. Doesn't matter who A is. Yeah, but why can't B equal C? B cannot be equal to C because B is the count I leave there, and my opponent has to take at least one piece, can't leave the same count. Remember, the legal move is pick a row and take at least one piece out. So that proves that whatever my opponent does, the XOR at the end of that cannot be what I left it, which was 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, with this, we're ready to move on. Okay? So that was our recap on binary, and we're done with that. We're going to have a quiz Wednesday, Thursday, when the recitation is. And uh, we have already a homework, and this will clearly show up in your midterm. Okay? That was the introduction to binary computing logic and a little bit of proofs. No, no, no. This, the whole box game, and now we have a new game, the 10 wise men, that's all extra. So you can ignore all that and still get an A++ rate, okay? There's no A++ rate, it's just an A. The, the regular sections have, they don't even heard about this game. And you're going to get the same midterm and homework sent, OK? So back to Julius Caesar, huh? <laughs> OK. So somebody figured out this, what this means. And before we figure out two, which is not hard, I'm going to map letters into numbers just for uh, create a lookup table just to know what we're talking about. So. Here, I'm going to create this table. Um, let me see how, how big this needs to be. Quite big, I think. Let's, uh, let's say, no, we need 26. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. about Julius Caesar. <laughs> M N O P Q R T is 18. S S. 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 <laughs> uh, so T is 19 then. U B W X Y Z. Hey, we made it. <laughs> So this is just a lookup table. It's no encoding, no nothing. I mean, you can call it encoding, but it's just saying, let's replace letters with numbers, because we know how to work with numbers better than letters. In fact, computers work with numbers all the time. They don't, they don't understand letters. We understand letters, because we see 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, and we say, oh, that, that's a big C, or that's a whatever character. But it's all numbers. So now, 
uh, I can interpret every every letter as a number, right? So who's V? Twenty one, right? Who is J? Nine. Who is K? Ten. Who is this C right here? Two, and so on and so forth. So of course, it doesn't make any sense. But the idea of this encoding is it's probably some text that makes a lot of sense to which some simple something happened, right? So you want to let us know what you think happened with the original text? How did we get here? How much we shifted by? Three or two? Two, right? So let's try to do that. Who's V? Again, 21. They say I, I shifted forward by two. So to get the original text, I have to do what? Shifting backwards by two. So let's apply minus two to the whole thing. V minus two is what? Huh? T. J minus two is what? K minus two? A, U minus two? This already looks very promising, right? How about E minus two? N minus two? C minus two? U minus two? U minus two? S. S. And then this U again, so it must be S again, because it's the same transformation if one of them is this looks very promising. Sounds like English, right? <coughs> okay. K minus two. Uh -huh. U minus two. S. B minus two. T. Q minus. Oh. Oh. J. C. A. T. R. F. D. Aha. Uh -huh. how do you That's how Caesars work. This cipher for Julius Caesar. How do you figure out how much you need to shift by? Right. Yeah. So that's the whole module about. Okay. How do we figure that out? It turns out it's easy because there's not too many things to try, and a lot of texts won't make sense. Okay. Only one will make sense, and it's fast to try. So it's a little bit of brute force. That's not hard. Yes. Question. I mean, you could also like. How did we find out the minus two, right? You could look at like the is and you know, so there's many ways to say by what are the typical two words vocals in English. And you don't try that many because they're not that many. And you quickly find these. So what are the three words in English? QQ indicates two letters that are the same, so on and so forth. Um, so A minus 2 would be Y then? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay. So she asks the following question. Huh, uh, that worked because the original text what was the highest letter in the original text? The one that goes the most to, to the right. Was this T, right, I think? And the most to the right, when I added 2 to it, I get V. So I didn't have the problem of moving too far away. right? But what if my original text is uh, having some late letters, right? That, that maybe the statement is this this class is too high, yay, good thing. What do I do with the yay? What's in this way I have to add to, right? This way I'm subtracting to. So how would I add two to y? You can wrap it around. So I can wrap it around. So y plus two is what? A. A. A plus two is C. And y again plus 2 is a. So the idea is that we want to wrap this thing around, which means this table is not very good in terms of how it looks. We would rather have a, a wheel. Let's do that. How about we make a wheel here? So uh, let's say I put a 0 here. And what's in the middle of the wheel? Zero. I think in the middle here, at some point, I have to have 13, right? Zero, one, two, three, 
Now, why did I have 0 to 25, 26 total ticks here? What, what, what dictates that 26 total ticks? Why did it 26 and not 71? Because there's 26 symbols in my alphabet that needs to be encoded, right? If I was an alphabet with 71 symbols, I'm going to have a table for 71. 26, there's nothing magic about 26. Happen to be 26 letters. I could have done this with 44, 71, any number I want. It's just a bigger wheel or a smaller wheel. So what's our encoding? A is 0, B, C, D, E, F, G. Let's get, this, let's get it right this time. Huh? I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, D, W, X, Y, Z. Now with the wheel, it's more clear how plus and minus go. Plus goes, of course, on the positive side, right? So when, every time I do plus, I go that way. And every time I do minus, I go this other way. So my, my, my encoding in this case, so I'm going to say here encoding, I'm going to say this is the message. This is the, the original message. Okay. Original is that. Original is a, a variable here. And the encoding <coughs> is what? Was original? How did I get the encoding? Original plus two, right? That's what I did to get encoding. I take this message and I add the two. Now, to do the addition of two, I had to map the letters to numbers. So addition works because it doesn't make sense to say L plus two. But I have this lookup table, which is universal. The table never changes, or the wheel. And I just say, whatever letter you see, add two to it. Add two, add two, and because it's a wheel, Anytime time I go, whatever letter you have, I'm just going to add to and move on the wheel. If I'm at the end, I just move forward. Okay? And the decoding, so encoding is do something with the original message. Decoding maybe write it better. There's a better schema to say. Here's I have the original message. If I encode, I get a cipher. Let's just call this one a cipher. And if I decode the cipher, I get what? <coughs> How these messages work. If I encode them, I send my messenger on the other side, they have to be able to find the original message, right? That's the whole point of communication. If I encode it to something that nobody can understand, what's the point of sending a message? So if I decode, I have to get back the original. My encoding and decoding are functions. This, what, this what function? How the encoding works? Adds two, right? And the decoding, how that works? They are inverse to each other. Whatever one does pushes the letters on the wheel to positions. The other one has to push it back to positions to get the original message. Who's with me so far? Very good. OK. Turns out this is too easy, right? He figured out the, again two minutes, and he, we didn't even teach encoding and decodings, right? So how can I make it more complicated? I have to create a more complicated the encoding function. And if I add, instead of two, I add three or four, it's equally easy to figure out what it is. Because some things will be easy to find. They just 
popular in English text. Everything that moves by a constant amount, even 2,000 years ago, they knew how to decode it. So here's a more complicated, so this is a more complex encoding function. Um, so, if I am to write this as an equation mathematically, I'm going to say cipher is original plus two, right? That's a, that's a mathematical education a, a, a equation that that governs this whole principle. The relationship between cipher original is adding two to it, and of course, the relation between the other way original is a cipher minus two. Now, this can be treated as numbers or sequences of numbers because I map letters into numbers with the universal table. A more complicated function would be to say, how about cipher is three times the original plus two. So not just adding two, but multiplying with three and adding two. Yes? Right, so for now, yes. The answer is, but how do we go, how do we do that? So I look at the original t. <coughs> t, what is 3 times t plus 2? How much is t? 19. 19, right? So 3 times 19 is? 57. 57 plus 2. So this t is 19, that is 50. 9, right? 57 plus 2. Everybody sees this? 3 times 19 plus 2 is 59. Well, where is 59 on this wheel? Seven. You have to go, you know, if I get to 0 to 25, and where is 26, first of all? Zero. <coughs> 26 is right here. And um, let's say plus this way. Minus that way. Where is 27? We've seen this principle before when we did the modulo, the, the basis of numeration, right? Like how bits get lost and numbers will only representing effectively modulo operations. So this is 28, and if I go all the way to 25, what this number is? Now, 51. But if I keep going, this 52 will be here, right? This will be 53. Where is 59 going to be? 59. And before that, if I go just one wheel off, it's going to be? So it's 7, 33, and 59. Why is 33 here? Because it's 7 plus 26. And then 33 plus 15 plus 26, it's 59. Every time I'm adding 26 units, I'm getting to the same spot because the wheel has 26 ticks on it. So adding 26 gets me to the same spot. Like at zero, I get 26.52. If I add another, another uh, wheel, what's the next value? 78, right? Adding 26. How about the other way? If I go to minus one, where is that? It's in here, right? From zero, go minus one, pick. How about minus two? That's here, minus three, minus four. If I go all the way, back to zero, what's in here? How many ticks did I go back to go at, at A or zero? Minus 26. And if I keep going in the negative side, what would this be? Minus 27, minus 28. And if I repeat the wheel all the way again here, what would be the number here? Minus 52. How about here? That would be minus 51. And this would be uh, minus 25. So when you read a tick like this, they all are differences of 26. 24 minus 26 is minus 2. Minus 26 is minus 28. The other way, if I add 26 to it, what do I get? So all those ticks correspond to Units uh, arithmetic progression of 26. And similarly here, 
See how they all correspond to progressions of 26? Zero, if I increase 26, go again the wheel 52, which is 26 plus 26. Go again the wheel 78, which is 26 plus 26 plus 26. The other way is minus 26 minus 52. All these ticks will work that way. For example, this one, <coughs> 7, 33. If I subtract 20 C out of 7, what do I get? Minus 19. And if I go against the wheel again on the negative <coughs> side one more time, minus 19. Minus 45. The, the ticks are at unit of 26. We good with that? Any questions? Okay, but now I have 59. So where is 59? 59 is right here, right? So what is this now? This is an H. That's the first character. Right? Because I look at 59 and I get an H. That's just a lookup table. 59H. How about the second character? I'm taking the second character, that's an H, which is what? Seven, right? So if I do three H plus two, I get what? How much is three H plus three? Huh? Which is? How about the next character, which is? I, right? I is how much? 3 times I plus 2 is which in that wheel is the same as 0. So that becomes an the next character is uh, S. S is what? 18. So 3s plus 2 will be 3 times 18 plus 2. Well, it's 56 in here. This is 59. That's 58, right? That's 57. And that's 56, right? So that is an E. Because uh, I'm a thick E. Did we understand how this works? So what would happen if you add a T and then uh, like a K close by? So I have a T, right? Well, yeah, T, so 19 times 3 plus 2 is 59. So let's, let's try that one and what he's saying. We, have a, we, you, we don't have a K. So I think his concern is, is it possible to take two original letters different, like T and K, for example? And when I do this whole thing, get the same value. The reason he's asking that is that encoding, decoding, that would be a problem. If two different letters encode to the same value, which is the same letter, then decoding will be impossible. How the decoder gonna know which one is it? So that's a fundamental problem of encoding, decoding. Uh, when we look at the encoding function, So there's actually two problems that we need to address, and that's one of them. So I'm going to say here, encoding, decoding. <coughs> Every original, if I have a uh, and it say original one, some letter, goes, I'm just going to call it O1. O1, that's an original letter. That will go with my encoding function. Encoding. To the cipher corresponding of O1. Like, for example, through this cipher, 3 original plus 2, T, went to H. As an example, letter T <coughs> through the encoding 3 times original plus 2 went to letter H. 
Now, if I have another letter, O2, that goes to the encoding, to, of course, a different thing, the first property, that's the one he was saying, we want, if O1 is not the same as O2, if I have two different original letters, like T and K, we want this to mean the cipher of O1 has to be different than the cipher of O2. So we want two different things, two letters, any letters, T and K, A and B, A and C, Z and B, whatever, two letters, if I pass them to the cipher to get two different values. I don't want to get the same value because if I get the same value, I wouldn't know how to decode it. And the other one, so that's property number one. Property number two is we need the decoding function. <coughs> so we need a way to take a cipher and pass it to the decode function to get back the original. Right? For this encoding method to be useful, on the other side of the cable, it has to be possible for whoever reads this, and it's not a spy, it's the actual destination, to be able to decode it back. What would be the decoding in here? We figured out in the first case that if the encoding is plus two, decoding is minus two. But what if it's like in here, three original plus two? How do I get the original in here? If somebody gives me the cipher, I'm trying to I'm going to try to reverse somehow this operation, right? So how do I do that? You subtract two and divide by three. I sub I take the cipher, the encoder. I subtract two because that's the you know the reverse of this. This was last operation plus two. I'm going to take two, and I'm going to say now divide by three, right? Right. Now numerically. That's obvious that this is the reverse function. Right? However, while we don't have to do it numerically, we are not on the numbers here, like real numbers of z. We are on this wheel. Our operations are not on set of numbers. So minus 2, I think everybody swallow it quite easily, because everybody can tell, if I go two positions on the wheel this way, minus 2 will be two positions back. So this minus 2 seems OK. Minus 2, what do we do? We take whatever we are, and we move two ticks backwards. But what about divide by 3? How division by 3 works on this wheel? Multiplication works, right? Because you take whatever number you have, you multiply with 3, you're going to get an integer, right? That integer is going to be somewhere on this wheel, guaranteed. If it's negative, we go back. If it's positive, we go for a matter. It's, it's going to be on the wheel. But division, how can I guarantee that division ends up on the wheel? Because if it doesn't end up on the wheel, what does this even mean? This is just, I can write the division fraction and three under it, but it's just a symbol. It has to mean an actual operation. So how do we do division on the wheel? It's even impossible. So I need a way to understand so again, minus 2 on wheel, easy. Everybody can say, move the, the characters back. But division by 3 on the wheel, what does that even mean? So let's try to figure this out. If, if this is an H, what's the H value? How do you do it? H value is what? Seven. That's a 7, right? So H is a 7. Subtraction by 2, that's easy, right? Minus 2, so I get what? 5. Right? That's easy, I just move the tick, two, 2 ticks back. But then I have to do what? So from 7, I get to 5, that's a minus 2. And then I have to divide by 3. How can I divide 5 by 3 and end up on this wheel? See, 
That's why we need modulo arithmetics to figure out how this division works. You have an answer for this? Uh, well, I was just going to say you can add 26 into this division. How about we guess? Can you guys give me a number that when I, I don't know, I don't know what this is in here, right? That's what I'm trying to figure out. This, let's call this variable uh, x. What property x needs to have? We want 5 divided by 3 to be x, right? 5 divided by 3 to be x. But we can write that in a different way. 5 has to be 3x. Is there an x on that wheel that when I multiply with 3 ends up being in t5? I think it is. How about 19? Didn't we start to 19 to get this to get this value? We are trying to reverse the operations we had, but we already did it the other way, right? We started with 19, we applied 3 original plus 2, and we got 7. Now we're trying to reverse this process. 7 minus 2 is 5, and then what multiplies by 3 gives me 5? I say it's 19. Let's try it. 19 times 3? Where is 57 here? At 5. So the, the number we need here is 19. So 5 divided by 3 on the wheel, guess how much it is? 19. Ain't that amazing? <laughs> Who would have guessed that 5 divided by 3 would give 19? Would you have guessed such a thing if I start the lecture that 5 divided by 3 is 19 and say, okay, this guy didn't sleep well. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not, we, we need a certain arithmetic and operations to understand why this goes. And it's not that complicated. I know it looks like magic. Just when I show you the first thing, it looked like magic, right? I should have turned the camera to film your faces when, when I put that in. <laughs> That's the same way when I do 5 divided by 3, I get 19. While we don't understand that yet, I'm sure we can understand the verification process, right? Which is 19 times 3, <coughs> it's 57. That's the same as 5 on this wheel. On this wheel, every single tick is the same thing. All the values, F5, 57, the other way will be minus 21, right? Those are the same exact thing. So we need an entire theory to build this up. Yes? No. Nope. Oh, that one does. Yeah. Or, or extra. So we'll figure how this works. It turns out when we do this is called a shift because you know just moving things by a constant amount. This is called a multiplication. When you shift, you can shift by anything you want. It's going to work. You can shift by two, by three, by five, by a hundred. That works. But when you multiply. Not all the multipliers like this three works. Anybody knows a multiplier that I could use here that would not work? The right side. Yeah, you. Well, then you can multiply any factor of 26. Right. Like, for example? 13. Or 2. If I use a multiplier that has a certain mathematical <coughs> property against 26, like 2, it's a common factor between 26 and 2. Wouldn't work. But 3 or 7 or you know, uh, 9 would work. 10 wouldn't work either because 10 and 26 have a common factor. So when we shift, we can shift by anything, bring it back. When we multiply, only some multipliers work because we can reverse them. Like 3 works, but certain multipliers like 10 or 2 or 13 don't work. We cannot reverse those. We'll run into this kind of problems. If we use something that's not a good multiplier, the, our cipher encoding decoding principle would fail. Will give us the same value for two different inputs, and we're not going to be able to decode it. There's no decoding function for it. So for now, while well, we don't know why, but we're going to know by next week. Shifting, you can add anything you want. That's okay. Multiplication, only some values work. So our job here is to explain modulo arithmetic and 
even further number theory. It's an introduction number theory in two weeks. Let me say something from the very beginning. The book, I wouldn't recommend the book for this chapter. Let me tell you what. The book is correct, of course, and the book is the minimum mathematical instruments that you need to solve the exercises. So can you go by the book and do the homeworks and do the assignments and get an A? Absolutely. Many people have done that. The book doesn't teach, however, a lot of mathematics. If you just want to go by to do the minimum math for this module to get a grade, read the book, do the exercises, done. But there's no point being in this section there. The whole point of being here in the other section is to learn more math. So I wrote 30 pages of notes of number theory that are on the website. And you can choose to go by the notes or by the book. But notes will be harder and will teach you a lot more mathematics than the book. Book will be easier, will give you all kinds of formulas and all kinds of rules to do things, but you not learn that much mathematics in the process. I want to be clear that you can go by the book and get an A, or you can read the notes and kill Friday nights and Saturday nights with those notes, <coughs> and then learn more math at the end. I'm going to follow the notes in class. Okay? So there's a PDF there, with number theory, and that makes more mathematical treatment of this whole chapter. So how we go into arithmetics, modulo arithmetics. We're going to figure out these ciphers, and we're going to do some that are a lot more complicated than these ones. Even this one that's more complicated, it's easy to break. The, the first one took about two minutes. This will take about 15 minutes. So still not good if you want to hide your messages. Right? <coughs> Takes 15 minutes instead of two. But we're going to, at the end of this chapter, going to give you a cipher that's impossible to break. Nobody knows how. And that's how all encryptions in the world is based on. On that mathematical principle that we're going to do at the end of the chapter. So modular arithmetic. Um, we're going to say here, <coughs> N, is the base or the, the mod and is uh, at least two integer. And this is fixed. So this n never changes. In this case, what is n here? It's modulo what? Now you can pick an n. You can do it Modulo 7, or modulo 11, or modulo 25, whatever you need. But that's always fixed. In a problem, n will never change. Whatever the modulo works on as a base, it's going to be fixed. Everything else is a variable. So if a is an integer, any integer, so we say a belongs to z, there exists unique Q, which is the quotient, and R, which is the reminder, both integers. R has to be in the set 0, 1, 2, up to. The reminders are division with n, are 0, 2, and <coughs> minus 1. That explains why this will go from 0 to. 25th, this is n minus 1, right? So, of course, I want to emphasize that this also means r has to be positive. So every time you get a reminder that's not positive, you're doing something wrong. A can be negative. A can be either positive or negative. But not the reminder. Okay? And the equation here that we have is A is N times Q plus R. So, let's recap how this goes. N is fixed, for example, 26. A is any integer. 
You can pick zero, you can pick minus 100,000, you can pick plus 100,000, a million, two, five, seven, minus two, minus five, minus seven, any integer. There are unique Q and R, a quotient and a reminder. Reminder has to be in this set from zero to n minus one. And the quotient will be whatever is necessary, such that the integer is n times Q plus R. So Q and R are unique. If you got the Q and R and your friend got another Q and R, this have to be the same Q and the same R. You cannot possibly get two different pairs Q and R that do the same thing. If you do, something must be violated here. Either one R is not in this set or something else happened, not in teachers or something. If you want a Q and R that satisfy this with R in this set, that's unique. So that helps a lot because if you can guess Q and R, Th those are the right ones, right? Unique means that, right? If I guess a QNR that works, then those have to be the correct values. That's what unique means. So, for example, um, let's say um, N equal five and A equal 63. I write 63 is 5, that's n, times what's the quotient? So, 12, and the reminder? Is this a valid reminder? That's your first question all the time when you see those reminders. Is this a valid reminder? I need what? 3 to be in what set? What's the set of possible reminders if n is 5? So the other conditions here, everybody understands and nobody had ever make a mistake on them. Like they have to be integer. If I tell you this is 11.3, uh, you would immediately say, wait a minute, 11.3 is not allowed because it has to be integer. But this, most people don't check. They get all kinds of R's, either negatives or way over four, and they, they pass through. That's a mistake. R, a reminder, has to be in this exact set. Otherwise, not valid. We have a name for this set. This is called set n. Of course, it's different for different n, so this would be what? This is z5. So the symbol z is the same like an integer set, but then if you put an integer, positive integer next to it, you don't mean the whole z just from 0 to 4, 0 to n minus 1. So the reminder must absolutely be in Zn, which is from 0 to n minus 1. Always check that. How about if I pick a different A here, say I pick A minus 11, because I say it works for any A, so minus 11 is 5 times what plus what? Hmm? Minus three plus four, is that correct? Is minus three times five, it's minus 15 plus four is minus 11. What else do I need to check? Four has to be a valid reminder. Is it a valid reminder? Yes, it is. Now, I could have wrote this as five times, uh, for example, minus four, plus, um, what do I need here? That's minus 20, I need a nine maybe? Yeah. That is correct as a mathematical equation, but it's not a valid integer division. Why? The reminder is not in the set that I need. So this is not valid integer division. Because, nine does not belong to Z5, okay? Okay, so uh, this is called integer division. And we say R is A modulo N. That's how we call this. We, we don't 
refer to q in this equation, to the quotient. What is the meaning in English of this? <coughs> if I divide a by n in an integer division sense, then what? I get remainder i. That's the meaning of this. It doesn't specify what the quotient is, other than, of course, the quotient has to be an integer number. <coughs> so that is um, the definition. <coughs> and um, I can drive this wheel for any any uh, n, right? So I have here n equal 5. How the wheel would look for 5? 0, right? 1, 2, 3, 4. That's the wheel for n equal 5. And then if I keep pushing on the positive side, I get what? In here is 6, 7. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, so on and so forth. If I go on the negative side, this is the same as minus 1, minus 2, <coughs> minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, <coughs> minus 6, minus 7, minus 8, minus 9, minus 10. Just like in there, if you look at the tick, it's arithmetic progressions of 5. Because they're the same tick on the wheel of 5, they have to have differences of 5 between them. This corresponds to a fixed reminder. All these have a certain reminder here. What's the reminder of all these numbers modulo 5? 2. Two. While the reminder on all these numbers is 4. Okay? Because by adding 5, I don't change the reminder. I could have drawn this wheel for 11. Here's another wheel for n equal 11. 0, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Those are the Z11, right? So that's Z11. It's all the numbers from 0 to 10. And then if I keep going on this wheel, 11 will be here, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, so on and so forth. If I go the other way, that's minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, minus 11, minus 12, minus 13, minus 14, minus 15, so on and so forth. If I, if I look at all those ticks, what's the difference between those numbers? 11. And the reminder of all of those numbers at 11 is what? This is R equal 7 bucket. How about in here? This is R equal 3 bucket. Everybody that fills in, falls in that bucket will have a reminder of 3. Everybody that falls in this bucket will have a reminder of 0. zero. How about this bucket? 6. <laughs> Every integer in that bucket will be a reminder of 6. At 11, of course. For different n, we need different wheels. That's a wheel for 11. That's a wheel for 5. That's a wheel for 26. Okay? So um, let's. Um, I want to do a theorem now. Quick thing. And actually, it'd be better to have the definition here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase this board. the first theorem on number theory here. We're going to say the following. N uh, corresponds to Zn, right? 0, 1, up to n minus 1. All these n's have to be at least 2, any teacher of course. <coughs> 
the following statements are equivalent. Now, I should say in this module, module part two of the course, every number is integer. So I'm not going to say that all the time. If I say, here's an A, here's a B, here's a C, here's N, M, Q, P, T, all those things are integer. Unless I otherwise specify, I say that's not an integer. All those numbers are integers. So we don't say it belongs to Z all the time, because they're all integers. So I'm going to say for any A and B, the following statements are equivalent. A mod N is the same as B mod N. That means they fall in the same bucket, right, on the wheel. So if you look at the wheel, whatever A falls in the bucket, B falls in the same bucket. I could say um, the equivalent thing. <coughs> A equal B mod N. That's not a theorem, it's just another way of saying the same thing. This is saying the reminder at A at N is the same as the reminder B at N. This is saying the same thing in a more short version. A is B modulo n. That doesn't mean they're the same integer. It means they fall in the same bucket on the wheel. Now, all the operations happen on the wheel, so when we say a equal b, we mean on the wheel. Uh, we could say a minus b, that's not on the wheel, because I don't say modulo. Modulo means on the wheel. Without modulo means the actual difference integers. So this is the difference of integers. May not be on the wheel. This is a n times something. That's a multiple of n. So if two things happen to be in the same bucket, their difference has to be a multiple of n. And the wheel of five. If two things are in the bucket, the any difference between numbers in the same bucket is a multiple of 5. On Z26, the difference would be a multiple of 26. Is there a way to write, like, A and B are in the same place on the wheel? Yeah. A equal B modulo N. But that's like a theorem. Like no, no, that's what we're going to write. A equal B modulo N is going to mean they are in the same bucket on the wheel. And the last thing... That's it's the same as this. It's saying, and there's a new sign that maybe you haven't seen. This sign reads as what? Hmm? How do we read this bar? Divides. It means integer division. It divides exactly that difference. I could say a minus b in a parenthesis. So these statements are equivalent. Whenever you write one of those four things, you mean the same. What you mean is they are in the same bucket on the modulo Zn. Right? So um, let's, let's do an example here. Let's say if n is 11, uh, a equals, let's say, 13 and b equal um, <coughs> minus 20. What is a mod 11? <coughs> the reminder of a if I divide with 11 is what? 2. Because 13 is 11 times what? 1 plus 2. Remember, every time you see this is the Q and this is the R, if Q and R works, those are the ones for sure because they're unique. It's not possible somebody else to find a different Q and R that works. What we need to verify is that the equation works. 11 times 1 plus 2 is 13. And what else we need to verify? 2 has to be in Z11. Is 2 in Z11? Yes. Yeah. How about the 20? How do I say those are the same? Minus 20 mod. 11. 
Why is this 2? Because minus 20 is what? 11 times what? Minus 2 plus 2. This is the quotient that we remind. Is this a valid equation? Gives me minus 20. 11 times minus 2 is? Minus 22 plus 2 minus 20. So 2 is the value reminder. I get the same thing. According to my theorem here, I could say that's the same as saying as A minus B is a multiple <coughs> of 11. Is that true? How much is A minus B? Minus 33. Is that a multiple of 11? It's 11 times what? Times minus 3. Every 11 times an integer, any integer, is a multiple of 11. Multiples of 11 with all 4 in the bucket, 0. These are all 11 times k. When I say times k like that, generic, means any multiple of 11. 11 times something are the multiples of 11. So let's do some other operations here. We can easily prove this thing, this theorem. Proof. One line. If A is N Q plus R and B is N, say, uh, L plus R, they have to have the same reminder. Then A minus B, if I make the difference, what do I get? NQ plus R minus NL minus R. R goes to the R. I get N times Q minus L. Obviously, it's a multiple of N. In other words, saying if they have the same reminder, they got to have this kind of equation, quotient and reminder. When I make the difference, the difference turns out to be a multiple of N. Um, let's do another operation here. How does summation and multiplication, how those things work? If I have 40 plus 39 mod 11, I could do this in two ways. I can sum them up, the sum is 79 mod 11. What's the reminder of 79 at 11? Yeah. 2. Or I can do it piece by piece. This is the same as 40 mod 11 plus 39 mod 11. Everything mod 11. How much is 40 mod 11? What's the reminder when I divide 40 by 11? 7 plus what's the reminder when I divide 39 by 11? 6. 6. Mod 11, that is 13 mod 11, which is 2. Addition works piecewise, or you can do the whole thing together and take the module at the end. What this tells you is that whether you do it like this or like this, you get the same answer. The, the, the rule is A plus B <coughs> mod N. You can do it either this way, or you can do A mod N plus B mod N, everything mod N. Same thing for multiplication. A times B mod N is A mod N times B mod N, everything mod N. So we can verify this, for example, 40 times 39 modulo 11. This value is 1560. Can somebody divide this by 11, tell me the reminder? <coughs> 11 in 15, the quotient doesn't matter. We don't need to t t keep track of the quotient here. 11 in 15 is once, four, 46, Four times, then I get a 20. 11 in 20 is once. Reminder is? Nine. How about if I do it piecewise? That's the same as 40 mod 11 times 39 mod 11. 
everything mod 11. How much is 40 mod 11? 7 <coughs> times 39 mod 11? 6. We did those modes in here. Those modes are the same. The operation is different. Mod 11, 7 times 6, 42. Mod 11, which is? So operations can be done piecewise or all together. It works out. Um, we didn't get to division yet, and we can't get to division today. We'll do division on Tuesday. But we can do other things. Um, other things. Let me see. I have an example here. Since I'm at mod 11, maybe I keep going with mod 11. So I've done addition and multiplication. And I've done this nice theorem here. How about raising at a power? Which is really multiplication, right? In, in some sense, it's just multi multiplications one after the other. So I have here 13 at 2 squared mod 11. This is really 13 by 13, right? So I could say 13 squared is what? 169. Mod 11, so if I do 169 mod 11, what do I get? I could write that if you guys need, when you write it, a little help on paper, like I do it in my mind, and you'll do it in your mind, but for right now, you can say, well, that's 11 times what? 15? Right, that'll be 165 plus 4 mod 11. Whenever you write something like this, it's obvious what the reminder is. The whole point of doing this, I didn't teach you division, is to have this 4 here. Is 4 a valid reminder modulo 11? Is it in G11? So this answer must be 4. Because I take the modulo, the quotient goes away. I only keep the reminder. Or I could have done it as 13 mod 11 times 13 mod 11, everything mod 11, right? Piecewise. So how much is 13 mod 11? 2 times 2 mod 11, that is 4, right? Easy. How about 13 to the 4th? No big deal. We think 13, is that, is that true? Is 13 to the 2 to the 2? Right? So if this is mod, you have to say mod 11 because if you don't say mod 11, this is a big number. Right? It's like tens of thousands. So mod 11, mod 11. Well, I could take the, the, directly the mod here, which I already got. 13 squared is 4. So it's 4 squared mod 11, right? I replace 13. Uh, let me put another step here to be clear what I mean. 13 squared mod 11 everything squared, and then mod 11, right? So I say I took the 13 square inside the, the last square. I say do the modulo first there, then square it, do another modulo. So I already have this answer from above. 13 square mod 11 is 4 square mod 11, which is, how much is 4 square? 16 mod 11? 16 mod 11, which is 5. You can be aware that these works for positive numbers and negative numbers, uh, all the same. And maybe uh, one thing that we can do is you can easily see how repeated squaring allows me to what would be the next power of 13 that I get by just squaring this one. I can easily get 13 to the 8, right? Because that is 13 to the 4 square, mod 11, mod 11. So I already got the 13 to the 4, that's 5. 5 squared mod 11, how much is that? 5 squared is 25, modulo 11 is 3. What would be the next power of 13 in this? I can, I can get 13 to the 9 by just multiplying with 13 if I want to, but if I square it again, what would be the next power? 
13 to the 16 will be modulo 11, will be what? It's 13 to the 8 squared modulo 11. I've already got 13 to the square. That's 3 squared modulo 11. How much is 3 squared modulo 11? 9, because 9 is a valid reminder. What's the point of doing this repeated squaring? That's pretty much like regular numbers. The point is, it's called fast exponentiation. Suppose I get 13 at none of these powers. These powers are very easy. Repeat square, repeat square. This one would have taken me how many multiplications to do it naively? If I do 13 times 13 times 13, how many multiplications I need here? 16. But this way, how many multiplications I've got? 1, 2, 3, 4. Much faster. Also, modulo works nice. I, even if they're big numbers, I take the modulo quickly and I bring it always down to small numbers. But what about 13 at the power of 7? That cannot be done directly with fast squaring. But if I'm smart enough, I break 7 into powers of 2, which is 13 at 4 times 13 at times 13, right? Now, you guys know when I put multiplication to basis, that adds up the exponents, right? We know that rule. Yeah. That is x at a plus b plus c is x at a times x at b times x at c, right? So if I break into powers of 2, those powers are somewhere in here, right? So how would this work modulo 11? This is modulo 11. So 13 at 4 modulo 11 is what? I already computed that. That's a 5. Times 13 at 2 in modulo 11 is a 4. And 13 modulo 11 is a 2. I took modulo on all of them. Mod 11. So this answer is 5 times 4, 20 times 2. 40, modulo 11? Imagine if you do it computing 13 out of 7 by hand and then division <laughs> by 11. That will take a long time. But this works easy. What if I have 13 at the power uh, 19? How do I do that, modulo 11? This is 13 at 16 times 13 at 2 times 13, modulo 11. So what's 13 at 16? 9 times 13 at 2? 4. Times 13? 2. Modulo 11. So 9 times 4. I could do it first, this piece. 9 times 4 is 36, modulo 11? 3 times 2, modulo 11. So that is a... So exponentiation, modulo anything, 11 is just an example. Exponentiation, never try to compute this by a calculator or by hand, big time. And some of these numbers will be like 700, 7,025 in the exercises. Please, don't attempt doing that. It has to do with breaking this into powers, fast exponentiation to get the answers, and compute the values modulo. It doesn't mean you have to do 7,000 multiplications by hand. All right, then. So, quiz next time. At recitation. Don't miss that recitation. Exactly the same kind of equation. Uh, no. Actually, I'm not sure. I think not. That will be clear by Sunday. We'll make an announcement what's included in the quiz. But I'm assuming the quiz relies on the meditation material. And since everything we did is not including this. Wait, wait, you skipped the entire middle. Hey, yeah. the middle. Oh, yeah. Oh, hey, Next time, middle first, okay? Yeah, thank you. And then we'll skip I have those sheets if you want. You're gonna get a zero.
towards that check in. But the PDF is online. Okay. You should do it. And you know, so it's just yeah. actually, so apparently have a quiz. I think so. I think so. So the zero is not a big deal. That's why participation is 5% of the rate. But doing the quiz is messing up the quiz. That's a single one. But there are all kinds of things oh, before. Keep it, I don't that 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 Maybe that's, that's what it comes to. Because it has to do with prime to go prime. It has to prime to go prime that way. But then there's a way to try to get it down to the class. If things go bad. You want to watch what you're doing, but if you advise to say, what's up with him? How are you not doing good? Well, he didn't come to class. It's for me to answer that question. We don't include the trade. But if you make something good, that's all of them are going to stay for <laughs> no, that's the 19th. The, 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 the section, you have to have this website because there's all kinds of material that you have to read. Not just the video. This is the last time. Yeah, we can look at this. All the recitation materials. Yeah, that one. Make sure you do the quiz. Like some of them we did in class, but some of them we did in class. Let me shut them down the camera. Yeah, come on.